This is Star Talk. Welcome to Star Talk All Stars. I'm your All Star host of this evening, Bill Nye, and I'm joined once again by my comedic, brilliant, insightful co host. The very funny as well as funny looking. <laughs> Chuck Nice. Yes. Thanks for being here again today, Always Chuck. It's a pleasure. Always. Now, today, Chuck, it may shock you to learn that on Star Talk, we're going to talk about science. What? Wait, wait, there's more. We're going to talk about science literacy and the importance of seeking knowledge and understanding of science writ large and all its manifestations. I don't understand what you're talking about. I'm talking about we're in a world where we have alternative facts. Apparently, that's like a thing now. Mm -hmm. And to help us out, we have Ross Anderson. Ross is a senior editor at The Atlantic, where he oversees the science, technology, and health sections. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Ross, thank you for coming and being part of Star Talk All Stars. This is great. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Big N fan of the show. Uh, great. Uh, Wow, that's great. <laughs> Let me ask you this. So for me, as a human here living, a voter and taxpayer and so on, we have a real problem of people not embracing science the way we once did here in the United States. Uh, do you have any, like, why is that? What's happened? Yeah. Um, well, first, I, I'd want to ask you uh, to push back. When you say the way they once did, what baseline are you kind of referring to there? When I was growing when up. When was peak science? Well, when I was growing up in the 1960s, <laughs> there was this amazing optimism about the future. And there was this, I felt, as a, of course I was a kid, felt this general belief that the process of science would enable you to put people on the moon, to have freeways connecting everyone in the United States, to have a uh, phone calls with video, which we got 50 years later. And these things would all be, the, and we'd feed everybody, and we'd cause the desert to bloom by irrigating it on enormous scales with things like the California Aqueduct and Hoover Dam and Ross Dam and Grand Coulee Dam. And we did. We did all these things. Mm -hmm. And uh, that optimism, it seems to me, it feels to me as though it's, not, it's tied to a denial of science, where you now have people who are against vaccinations, you have people who don't trust in agriculture and genetically modified foods. And you have the, the big thing that's going to affect everybody on Earth is the denial of climate change. Now, is my perception incorrect? Am I misperceived? Do we have uh, <laughs> statistics to back up my claim? Yeah, I think there's something really interesting. I think uh, there's a lot of things going on there. So. I do think that broadly people are still quite optimistic about the role of science and technology and innovation in their lives and, and uh, the ability for all of those fields, if they can be called fields, to make the world better. Um, however, as you point out, when it comes to vaccines or when it comes to climate change, people seem to suddenly they're not taking a real kind of objective look at the facts. They seem to be, have made those positions more about identity. Um, they've been politicized. Mm -hmm. And when and, you say identity, what do you mean? I am uh, a yeah. dorky white guy from the East, so therefore I feel this way? Um, it, it may be that, so when I, when someone asks, when a pollster asks me, let's say I'm, I, I don't believe in climate change, when a person asks me about my beliefs about climate change, I'm not the, the in, I don't want to speak for anyone, but it might be that I'm not going immediately to some sort of objective reading about the Earth's atmosphere. And instead, I'm thinking I'm going to authority figures within a particular political movement that I ascribe to. Mm. So you're expert in your if you are a climate denial in the denier in this example, mm -hmm. your expert is not a scientist or, or is not the scientific community. Your expert is your leader, your political leader. Well, I want to go to something that you said when you said the 1960s, that there was this optimism. I wonder if there was a point of divergence where, at that point, it was more or less true that short-term business interests were broadly compatible with science. I mean, I think there's some exceptions when it comes to kind of the early Clean Air Act stuff, for instance. Um, and now we're at a point, at least with the fossil fuel in industry, uh, where there's a real tension between sort of taking a real candid look at climate science and, uh, you know, uh, the stock price of uh, ExxonMobil, for instance. 
So, <clears throat> so people tie themselves to that, um, to the leaders, to the way of life of, of extracting fossil fuels rather than to the science? What, well, what you, uh, unpack that, as we say in the business. Sure. Yeah, I think that political leaders mm -hmm. make that calculus. And then there's all kinds of things that happen where, you know, uh, political media on the right, for instance, uh, becomes sort of driven to uh, seek out any scrap of information that, that could help uh, you sustain a climate denial position. Um, and to magnify that and to not, say, report straight on the IPCC report or something like that. It's cherry-picking data is an yeah. old problem. But, but isn't that also right. due to the fact that these political leaders are, um, how can I put it, without, I, I don't want to be indelicate. Uh, aren't they in the pocket of, uh, <laughs> of, of big oil? Let's be honest. So when you have, uh, when you have a convention where uh, it's a political convention, and on the floor of that political convention, people are chanting, drill, baby, drill. Those yeah. people don't have any uh, inherent benefit from, yeah, they do. from going drill, baby, drill. It's the political leaders no, no, that are no, being no, paid on, off no, by. If you're from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. your economy depends on extraction, depends on oil and gas. Yes, but your economy can also depend. And I don't mind those people. Don't get me wrong. No, he's it, some of his best friends. Yeah. I, listen, I, I, yes. <laughs> but no. I understand when you uh, don't believe something because it hits you in the pocket. That I'm cool with that. Okay, because guess what? You you're, you're feeding your family, and so you say, "I don't want to hear it," because I got to mm. put food on the table. Perfectly understandable to me. There are not enough of those people to drive the narrative. That's what I'm saying. So all the other people that join with them. They do it because of a political identity that is tied to the people who have a financial tie to the issue. So do you agree with that, uh, Ross? Well, so one supporting point, I think, for, uh, for Chuck's point is that big oil is to the left of uh, kind of the Republican mainstream voter when it comes to climate change. You saw that in the Rex Tillerson hearing, right? Um, it, when hey, you hey, tell us what he means. So, oil executives are 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 mostly on board with climate science to the extent that they they kind of admit that human caused climate change is a real thing. Um, their preferred policy objectives for dealing with it might be different. They tend to kind of uniformly uh, favor a carbon tax uh, as opposed to some of the other things that you know more radical uh, emissions cutting. So, policies. what's a carbon tax? Tell us about a carbon tax. Carbon tax is that you. You basically slap a tax on any carbon emission so that, you know, you're familiar with this idea of an externality. Love so the, the externality, yes. Love the externality, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And so this is in economics when you pass the price of whatever you're producing on to somebody else. You right. pollute the river and people downstream have to pay for it. Yes. So carbon emissions right now are a free externality. Um, if you run a coal plant, for the most part, you can just steam carbon into the air and, and it's free. Uh, and so a carbon tax would, would tax that activity. Um, and oil executives are favor this or Ross Tillerson favors this? Rex oh, Tillerson they, favors they, it? You know, it's, uh, they say that, yeah, I mean, we should take them at their word, right? Yes, uh, they, they favor a carbon tax. How stiff a carbon tax? Um, it might be quite a light carbon tax that they favor. Uh, it might be that this is sort of the best stalling tactic they've identified. Yeah, I, I, I think that's uh, more likely. Then Chuck, but then to Chuck's point, which I think you're about to address, Ross, yeah. was people get on board with this even though they're not invested in it. That's they get right. on board with this point of view, rather, even though they're not invested in it. But the more interesting thing, I think, is Chuck's point, is that you have people for whom their bottom line actually is not affected by policy positions on climate change at all. And it is only because they have either grown up within or come to identify with a political movement that takes climate denial as sort of one of its signature badges. Um, that's why they oppose climate change. So here we are. Let's say we're on a science-based show, a science <laughs> show that claims to embrace science literacy. How would we change the minds of these climate deniers? And it's important because... 
uh, the more carbon we put in the air, the more people are going to be affected, the more sea levels are going to rise, the more weather patterns are going to change, and it's all going to happen faster than it's ever happened, and so on. How do we change the minds of people? Is it possible? Well, I've got a three-point plan. Oh, cool. Oh, just kidding. Right. Just kidding. Just kidding. I don't know. I don't know. It's a hard problem. <laughs> well, here's what I, here's my current thinking. Had me on. Here's no, my current ahead. thinking is the so-called cognitive dissonance where you have a worldview that's incompatible with what you're seeing. Yeah. So you have uh, this troubling situation in your brain and you come up with a rational rationalization, and the more evidence that con contradicts your worldview, the harder you rationalize it. The, you double down on your denial. And uh, cognitive dissonance, the classics when I was in college was, uh, if you see, if one group sees the movie for free, they, the movie's okay. If another group pays money for the same movie, they tend to like it more because they're more invested in it. Yeah. And then there were gradients, like people who paid less for the movie than more than the movie. <laughs> and so uh, when the more you're invested in denying climate change, the harder you deny it to keep from having this discord, this dissonance in your yeah. the front of your brain. Uh, the sig singular, um, uh, there's, a, I, there's a region of the brain that has conflict. Yeah. The conflict I do, region. <laughs> I do wonder, um, and this is this is a strategy that that I think has been tried to some extent uh, implicitly. But you know, there are certain areas of science that do seem to be bipartisan. That you know, people do seem to take kind of a universal pride in, say, uh, the images generated by the Hubble Space Telescope, rockets, um, and and quite a patriotic pride, right? Or mm. rockets, or right, the Apollo missions. Well, um, but uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, perfect. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and so I wonder if there's a way of integrating climate science or all kinds of science. You know, it's drilling down on the, you know, the fact that the, uh, the empirical scientific method is what gets you something like a Hubble Space Telescope. You know, that is this kind of bedrock edifice, and that's also sort of telling us this other thing over here about climate change or vaccine science or whatever it is. Um, it's not a very good three-point plan, but it, it, it's, it might be a direction. Well... Uh, so we say all the time, space exploration, because we're on Star Talk. Right. Yeah. Space exploration <laughs> brings out the best in us. Mm. And this is where you find common ground. You talk about partisanship. The example I give, examples I give everybody are Adam Schiff from mm. Bleeding Heart, uh, Raving Blue State, California, yeah. and John Culberson from Red State, Double Down, <laughs> the safest place is the state capitol building because everybody's carrying a weapon. Uh, Culberson, those two guys agree like nobody's business on exploration of Europa, of all things, a moon of Jupiter. Mm -hmm. You got to send a huge rocket out there and invest for years to get the mission pulled off. That's where they find common ground. Yeah. Now, Culberson generally, writ large, is a climate change skeptic, extreme skeptic, what right. I would call a denier. Schiff is embraced, very concerned about it. So where do we get these two people together where they both have these worldviews that are just incompatible? Yeah, I wonder if it is in, you know, the science of Venus or the science of Mars um, where you say, look, the science that makes these very missions possible, you could not go to Europa unless you had a sophisticated understanding of how a planet works, right? Well, there's um, more to it than that or less to it than that. <laughs> people, no, and the other guy's Lamar Smith from Texas. Yeah. These guys have, he's got a picture from... Hubble on his wall, a huge, very sharp, high-resolution color picture taken by the Hubble telescope of a star field, deep space. Mm -hmm. And yet he's a climate denier. This is surprising to us. So there's something, Some you mentioned the word identity. There's something visceral with these guys that um, they're not to us on my side of it or maybe Chuck, Dr. Nice's side of it. Uh, they're not embracing the same science that that we yeah. are. Well, since there's a new sort of nationalist streak in conservative politics, one wonders if um, if the United States were to pay a severe cost in status that was legible to someone like Lamar Smith or even just a, a, a everyday conservative voter, um, would that be an important signal? Because of our pulling out of Paris, for instance. Let's say we pull out of Paris and we're sort of the laughing stock of the world and um, China emerges as this sort of, you know, ultra-responsible new leader of the world order. Um, you wonder if people would sort of double down and backlash, 
probably what would be more likely to happen. But there's there's one scenario where people would kind of register that and think about, wow, it's a weird thing for the U.S. not to be at kind of the idealist bleeding edge on a scientific issue. I got news for you. We are already the <laughs> laughing stock of the world. So it's a little late for that. Well, I mean, I do have, <laughs> oh, but you guys, uh, just anecdotally, I have friends in Denmark, mm-hmm. Australia, and Britain yeah. that are just like what are, and Japan and what are you guys doing they're asking yeah what do you, what's right. up with this and um, but all those countries with the possible exception of Japan have their own kind of quite strident uh, nationalist oh, uh, yeah. right wing movements on the rise so uh, what we want to do is bring people together i believe we want to bring people together and address climate change in a big picture way so if you think it's their identity, they want to be part of a movement, is there a way to influence that movement? And you had a cool idea there, Ross, where we're going to we're make it a national thing, a nationalist thing, that we're falling behind the rest of the world if we don't do blank. Take it. Yeah. What do we do, Mr. Yeah, Anderson? Well, here's an idea. We, uh, I'm really interested to see what NASA's promotional campaign for the James Webb Space Telescope looks like as we come closer to launch. Um, and I do wonder, uh, perhaps, it, <laughs> perhaps not, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's tough to see something like this happening in the next few years, but I do wonder if there is a way to integrate planetary science or uh, just, you know, uh, the larger NASA mission, which obviously, as, as both of you know, uh, has Earth science as a very high priority, at least for the moment, um, into the publicity in the run up to that march. I have a feeling that the James Webb Space Telescope is something that people are going to be very proud of. Just like they were proud of Curiosity and just like they were proud of the Hubble Space Telescope. And New Cosmos. Horizons. New Horizons. Yeah, and New Horizons, Peru. right. Yeah. That's right. I think what we should do is uh, find a way to blame uh, Mexicans because that really seems to resonate with people. Uh, I think you're being ironic, Chuck. I I think if you just say, don't let Mexico, they're stealing all of our weather. Don't (laughs) let Mexico steal our weather. By the way, even climate. The Astronautical Congress (laughs) was in Guadalajara this year, which is being... The Mexican people are very proud. It's the Silicon Valley of. See, it's Mexico. already happening. It's yeah. already happening. <laughs> well, maybe maybe you'll have like Bay Area style weather in Canada before not too long, and we can kind of make America cool again. <laughs> oh boy! Bitch. <laughs> but this is a big problem that I really want to figure out. How do we get people to work together on this? And I guess it's just everybody doubles down. Is not is two is not is two. But yeah, it has something not to do with science. It is. Uh, it's some other human nature thing. And so where do we what do we do next, Chuck? I know you're a cynical, bitter, miserable guy. I'm a cynical, right bitter, mi- miserable guy, mostly because I'm a comic and that's you know really what we are. <laughs> and that's uh, why you love the person. That's exactly. <laughs> he's just it's limitless material. And let me tell you, uh, listen, he's the joke writer in chief, and I for one I do appreciate that. Well, thanks him. for your appreciation, Chuck. <laughs> this is Star Talk All Star Edition, and we'll be back right after this with Ross Anderson from the Atlantic. Welcome back to Star Talk All Stars. We've been talking about scientific literacy and science education and climate denialism with uh, with uh, Ross Anderson from the Atlantic, and I've been your host, Bill Nye, here guest hosting on my favorite podcast, the ones with Chuck Nice, ah, who's my go. co-host here in the studio. Hey. And uh, Ross Anderson is our guest, and he is a senior editor at the Atlantic. But before we get to uh, before we get to the next thing, which, are, which will be cosmic queries, yes, you have a new show playing with science. Chuck. Playing with science, it's uh, it's a Star Talk branded show where um, uh, branded. That's hip. That's yeah, that's what we say what in, the, the in the twenty doing that. the twenty pluses. Yeah, that's right. So uh, it's a it's a show where we take iconic sports plays and uh, we iconic break sports plays. Yeah. So think of like uh, the Immaculate Reception, right? And this is uh, thirty years ago. Yes, it is. A lot of football. Yeah, a little football thing, and uh, we'll break down. There's been a lot of football since that. And you know what? We're going to get to all of that too. The, but the you Fog Bowl. Somewhere. I, the fog 
fog where it was foggy one day. The fog bowl? Yeah. The fog bowl. So, hey, you know what? That's a good idea for a show, as a matter of What fact. about the kinetic so, energy of a modern player? There you go. How about that? Uh, so, all of these things, you're really good at this. This is all the things that we talk about so the thing on that, the show. Uh, the thing that amazes me about modern football players, professional players, is how fast they are. Okay, so that's a show when that I we're doing. When I was a kid, they were fast and tough and took a lot of punishment, but they go so, they run so much faster, and the so, money's in it, and so we actually we actually so. explore that in a show where we talk about the science of sports nutrition and strength and conditioning, as well as player tracking through um, um, artificial intelligence that they use. So um, we have like uh, uh, we're going to be talking to O.C. Uminura, Santonio Holmes. We spoke to uh, Glenn Tobias of the New York Jets and the uh, uh, Boston Red Sox, who is a nutritionist, a sports nutritionist, um, and uh, it's a fabulous. Show. It really is. So, with uh, that said, as a matter of fact, and uh, we'd love to have you on. Okay, to down okay. Some of the behind it, this has been a lovely digression. Yes. Ross Anderson, <laughs> the Atlanta, senior editor at the, the Atlantic, is here, and uh, it's Ross, time for Cosmic Query. It is, I, and I, Ross, I'm I just registered that Chuck did not invite me onto the show. Also, well, uh, you show us your sports chops. <laughs> all right, yeah, I'm going to work why in sports people, for the rest why, of the show. Yeah. Why are we? Why do we have intercity rivalries? What human nature thing is that? Uh, I mean, it seems like a pretty obvious tribalism thing, right? Mm-hmm. I feel go. like in in my life, I've most understood tribalism when, you know, watching like a, a Laker game winner or something of course. like that. It's, yeah. it's the safest gang war you can ever have. They, yeah. <laughs> everybody lines up on their t- behind their team. You got your colors and everything like that. And then they can do battle and you can be a part of it vicariously. It's you wonderful. You can imagine that if I were down on that field, right. you know, <laughs> I could hit that pitch. Chuck I could catch it. that. Sure, I could outrun that guy, <laughs> that major league athlete. Yeah. Sure, I could. I could kick that field goal. Yeah, it's amazing. And that's, make that putt? You that's, think that's hard? That's where, and listen, that's the great thing about it. It's like you can be a fat guy on the couch, and, and when your team wins a championship, you can go, we won. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's query. So, Ross, you're going to be on telling us about tribalism. Yeah. I'm excited. But, yes. But first, a yeah. cosmic query. Take it, Chuck. Cosmic queries. Uh, let's get into it. And we always start with a Patreon patron. And so let's go with- they pay to be on. And absolutely. So it here, works here. We can be bought. <laughs> we can be yeah. bought. Much like your politicians, people. Okay. Chuck, you are just a miserable man today. It. I can't. Lead stop. on. Lead on. <laughs> What's wrong with me? Okay, here we go. Uh, off of Wiedershen, Wiedershen says, how should I engage people in civil discussion about science if they are quick to, to dismiss most science based on their own biases or religious background? So, you know, we were talking about that earlier, uh, but he's broadening it out from climate denial to just general science. And there's a lot of general science that is uh, rejected by people for various reasons. Ross, uh, why? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Ross. Why do people yeah. think that the earth is 6,000 years old? Yeah, I think it's tough when um, when you do see that signal in any kind of conversation where someone is really committed to having a very literal reading of the cosmology of a, a Bronze Age text. That's a tough situation to be in. One that I've found um, some success with recently is going right at the flood story um, by looking at, hey, you actually don't see genetic bottlenecks um, when you look at the lineage of every single animal on Earth to two individuals. Uh, uh, no, in the, the people, <laughs> the deniers, I was spent a lot of time with those guys, you know, in yeah. Kentucky. They claim that they, they show calculations where all dogs became wolves, became this is all one, that there's plenty of time. 6,000 years is plenty of time in their view. <laughs> the, other, the other one, though, that I think is really good for the, the flood story is just uh, pointing to the quite natural uh, scientific explanation for why there are flood myths dispersed, you know, across cultures all across the earth. And that's because we had the end of an ice age. Um, and so the seas rose, right. And you had all these kind of coastal cities and civilizations that were swamped and that has a real nice hook in the climate change, doesn't it? Oh that's, yeah. Boy, that's really going to win hearts. And uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's a climate change 10,000 nope. years ago. And that's why everybody actually, it's very cool to me. I mean, yeah. cool in a, uh, in a, intellectual way, also yeah. kind of troubling as sea levels rise on our coastal cities today. But uh, we got to find common ground. 
All right, let's move on to Tim Shaw, who says this. I'm worried that our progress will be dangerously slow in a world where alternate facts are something real and not simply a joke. Um, Hey, way to go, Tim. Uh, How do you go about changing someone's mind who is at a level of debating clear facts? Is it worth it to try or better to just focus on advancements of science while ignoring them? So, Ross, how do you deal when alternate facts become an actual consideration how do you talk to someone? Yeah. I mean, seriously. Is this like Uncle Bob at Thanksgiving that we're talking about? Or or this is like a prospective voter? What do we think? Well, you know, I think both. I mean, Uncle Bob is one thing. But then when you talk about a prospective voter, you talk about how do you get true information to somebody who is who can consume it and know the difference? So, you know, uh, yeah. it, 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 that's a that's a really That's a problem. Well, here's what happened, you guys. Enough people embraced a worldview that we have an administration that has alternative facts now. So we're not reaching. We, they, it is not reaching somebody. And Ross, do you know how we reach them? Come on, man. You're yeah. a big time journalist. <laughs> Am I? The wow. problem. No one's ever called me that. I'm going to say um, the, the problem, Ross, though, is that you are a journalist and you are probably the most dishonest person in the world. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And according to Steve Bannon, I should shut my mouth <laughs> right. Um, right away. So I can't answer this question, actually. Um, no, I, I do think that it, you know, in the years to come, um, I'm. Obviously, in the line of work I'm in, I really want to stay open-minded and, and really try to persuade people uh, of, of these extraordinary achievements uh, that, that science has produced. Um, but at a certain point, look, we've all been wrapped in those conversations, whether it's with family members or people you meet elsewhere, where you're just not there. There's not a common body of evidence, even uh, that you, you know that any source that you bring up, people are willing to discredit. Um, or, or question your motives or whatever it is. And in that case, it might be that we sort of have to, sadly, uh, kind of hunker down and um, lean into the culture of science where it exists. And fortunately for us, uh, not uh, the culture, the scientific achievement, the levers of government cannot limit that uh, completely. You know, there's, ton, there's a ton going on in the private sector. Obviously, Elon Musk is... is uh, is doing lots of exciting things, and uh, as as you see advancements in those fields, we can all continue to celebrate those and hope that people come around. Cool. Well, what if people don't come around? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not joking, you guys. I know you're not joking, but we have. <laughs> it's, suppose we end up with tariffs on our most popular trading partner, and we don't have spare parts for cars or uh, air conditioners. I, yeah. so I'm, then, uh, I said it. I'm going black market avocado, man. Yeah. It's going to be awesome. Now everybody knows about like, oh, your that's plan. Right. Damn it. Oh, that's right. Oh, sorry. And if you put the nice brand, put the nice brand, it'll <laughs> slip right in. Nobody, <laughs> you know. nobody will know. So uh, uh, anyway, there's potential problems, and we have to find ways to. Uh, the word I want to use is reason with our fellow voters, but. It's really, it's really a challenge. Let's take another question. All right, here we go. This is Amy Zinda from Facebook who says this. Um, and, you know, but before I read this, and I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm kind of joking. I'm being a little uh, surly. I'm not being political. I really believe that anybody has the right to hold whatever political beliefs you have. So please do not write me and say, Chuck, you're <laughs> anti-Trump. I'm not anti-anything. Oh, no, you? I am not. I am not. Oh, I am, yes. I'm just pro-facts. And pro um, critical thinking. That's all I am. It's all Chuck yeah. is. That's it. I'm not anti anything. Okay. Me too. I'm going to co-sign that disclaimer and steal it for myself. <laughs> there you go. So anyway, Amy Zenda says this: since there seems to be a growing distrust of scientific research funded by the government, and several frightening steps. What is she? Go ahead. <laughs> and fr- several frightening steps uh, by the new administration to quash the publishing of results and information. What are some other sources, either online or in print, for quality scientific literature that we can rely on in the coming years? Hmm. Uh, oh. uh, that's a good question there, Amy. The Obviously, Atlantic. the Atlantic. <laughs> <laughs> the Atlantic is your main yeah. source. <laughs> Ross Anderson's a, a, no. 
a magazine about what? About oceans. The Atlantic Ocean. The Atlantic Ocean. The Atlantic uh, Ocean. we cover. Yeah. It's, it's um, big. No, I think uh, it, maybe nature uh, is, is one that we can point people to. Um, the Planetary obviously. Society, planetary.org. Yes. For all your planetary space news. Great. Yes. Uh, this is a great question. Is, is this question of authority? Yeah. If people that discount authorities or experts in fields, then you're, you're really lost or you can be lost. So what I yeah. say to everybody, the thing about the modern world with the Internet and so on is you have to learn to filter information. Yeah, you do. So go online, look at all the stuff and look for <laughs> see if you think it's reasonable. Wow. So, uh, you know, that's funny because our next uh, question, uh, I don't know if this is a question or not. I think it might just but be a rabid statement. It might just be a rabid statement from Peter Allen Jacobs on Facebook. Okay, I'm just going to be honest. I'm the one who wrote all these questions. No, (laughs) 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 no. Uh, Peter Allen Jacobs says this. He's uh, coming to us from Queensland, Australia. He says the most essential invention is an Internet filter, which we can reliably distinguish. Fact from opinion from BS. Uh, <laughs> no such thing, man. <laughs> and so that's what I want to know. So I'm asking both of you, with the advent of fake news playing such an important role in this past election. You're not political. No, I'm not political. I'm no. not. I'm, not, I'm really not. I'm, I'm, nice. I'm really asking. I'm really asking. How, it, how would you, Ross, in your industry, how do you go about distinguishing fake news is there a responsibility to to say like this is this is not real like you have the onion right but we all know if you read it in the onion it's satire it's not real so how can we have something like that for actual news ross yeah um facebook has been uh uh experimenting with an algorithm where if enough people say that something is fake or reported as fake news it, a little icon pops up next to it that says this is disputed. Um, they, they actually, uh, we, we wrote a piece uh, arguing that they should buy Snopes and actually have their own kind of full-time mm-hmm. fact-checking team inside just to kind of get the, like, the very worst of the stuff mm-hmm. off Facebook. They've also banned, I think, something like 180 outlets already um, from posting. But uh, yeah, they, they've had some success with this algorithm. And, and the word is, and this is all very preliminary research, but that it does actually work that, that when people see that disputed icon, uh, fortunately, so maybe Facebook will be the ultimate honest broker in the end. Uh, they do. There's not, not a good chance of that. No. But, um, <laughs> yeah, you scared the hell out of me just well, then. The thing about it, but the, but the crowd, um, crowd uh, sourcing, crowd review has some value when if you have enough people going on. But you at The Atlantic, you try to be a mainstream journalist, right? You are a mainstream journalist and you have standards of research and so on. That's right. So how many people, when you write a story of 2,000 words or so on, how much research do you, are you guys do, you do traditionally? Yeah, like for instance, um, I've been working on a sort of 9,000 word climate change feature for our April issue for the last, you know, six, eight months um, that took me to Siberia. Um, And it's been copious amounts of research talking to climate researchers and people in Russia and uh, uh, everything in between. I can't really get into the details, but you'd um, have to. What what, what did you see in Siberia? I, I can't say, but we uh, we also have <laughs> just a devoted fact checking team who, uh, for whom I am eternally grateful. Uh, it's amazing to publish a piece that has rigorous fact checking behind it. The way we have in the magazine is just a wonderful feeling. It gives you really solid ground to stand on. Uh, how much energy do you guys put into? Uh Denying the fake news people. Do you get, do you get, um, I guess you have letters to the editor that you filter and so on. Sure. But do you guys plan to, di- to what is the discredit fake news outlets kind of thing? Yeah, some, I think for us to take a swing at it, and I don't want to speak as though the Atlantic has some exalted position in the world of media, but for us to kind of deem it worth our time, it has to achieve a certain level of popular currency. For us to take. I mean, if we were, we, we just don't have the staff to be, for instance, sifting Facebook all day, kind of looking for specious claims about science, and it would it would take up all of our time because there are a lot. And speaking yeah. of take up all our time, <laughs> Chuck, Ross, 
We'll be uh, here. This is Star Talk All Stars. Uh, I'm Bill Nye with Chuck Nice and Ross Anderson from the Atlantic, and we'll be back right after this. Welcome back. Welcome back to Star Talk All Star Edition. I'm your host this week, Bill Nye, along with the brilliant and insightful Chuck Nice. And yes, this week, nicely said, this week. Our guest is Ross Anderson, who's a senior editor at The Atlantic. We're talking about science literacy. And I got to tell you guys, I feel like we go over the same ground over and over. Oh. That we are, we are scientifically literate, we are well-researched, and those other people, the, those other people are not, but I just don't know how we're going to reach them because it's important to reach them. We're all in this together. And this is the Cosmic Query portion of the show. Yes. So let's take a question. Yes. And look at it from a scientifically literate, embracing the other side point of view. Take it, Chuck. Okay. I'm going to give you a, <laughs> I'm going to give you a good challenge on that one. Uh, Drew Huber from Facebook says this, are there still scientists that are using alternative facts to claim that climate change is not real? Well, there's the cherry picking of data. Ross, do you, you deal with this all day, I take it? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. You do have people who will, for instance, point to a particularly heavy snowstorm in California uh, or a cold day in January and say, oh, see, yep, nope, climate's not changing, just like we thought. Senator Inhofe showed up in the, on the Senate floor with a snowball. <laughs> with a snowball. <laughs> he had found, so we laugh, but he and his, oh. the people that vote for him at some level think he's on the right, tra on the right track. Wow. Yeah. Stunning. That is well, it's just absolutely that, stunning. Uh, but there are fewer snowball days than there used to be. That's uh, something to consider. But it's confronting people or embracing people or becoming partners with people who uh, have doubled down on yeah. ignoring scientific, what seem to be provable scientific facts. Let's try another query. All right, John Clemens from Facebook. Is social media making us dumber? Huh? Uh, <laughs> uh, is Not my Star Talk on your yeah. electric phone? <laughs> there you go. Intel device. Star Talk's enriching your life and making you that much smarter. Right, everyone? <laughs> right, Uncle Phil. <Bill. laughs> um, it, Ross, you deal with your yeah. used to be a print magazine exclusively, but right. how much of what fraction of your business is online now? Oh, I mean, the vast, vast, vast majority of it. I mean, we we publish maybe ten to fifteen pieces in the print magazine monthly, and we publish maybe forty or forty-five articles a day uh, on yeah. the web. Oh, wow! It's a factor of a hundred thereabouts. Yeah. So, uh, do you feel that uh, there's a people people who, who follow you online don't accept your reporting as accurate? Do you have the pushback because it's social media and it's dismissed as being as making us dumber? Um, Sometimes well, I think there's a couple things going. First of all, I want to say that of of course, like any human being, uh, we beings, we make mistakes um, and uh, we regret them, and we try to be really transparent about correcting them uh, and as quickly as possible. Um, but yes, uh, as far as social media making people dumber, I'm I'm just not. I feel like any totalizing narratives around social media and it making us smarter or dumber are, are usually sort of themselves dumb. Uh, it's, it's obviously a nuanced <laughs> phenomenon. I don't know about you guys, but I've been, I mean, I've found social media making me smarter in all kinds of ways. I feel more kind of in touch with what's happening, uh, in the world on a moment to moment basis. Now, whether what that's doing for me, psychology is psychologically is another matter. But I remember, late. uh, Gil Scott Heron with the revolution will not be televised. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Turns right. out it is being, if you have a revolution, <laughs> it better be on Twitter. Or it's not happening. Absolutely. So, uh, um, <laughs> To that end, imagine how much more difficult it would have been, no matter how you feel about these ladies, who, how much more difficult it would have been to organize the Women's March without social media. That's right. With Great social example. media, it was uh, <laughs> millions of people showed up in several cities, dozens of cities. And uh, how do you, Ross, do you have any opinion about this proposed science march? Yeah, well, so... Uh, uh, one of the responsibilities of my job is not to advocate for <laughs> uh, political uh, activism of any sort. But, but um, you're reporting We'll be on... watching it with interest. Yeah, okay. All right. Yes. Okay. Let's take another query, Chuck. All right. Uh, this is 
O-I Ocha. Uh, O-I is how you spell the first name. I don't know how to say that. Oi. Oi? Okay. Oi Ocha. Oi Ocha. There you go. If people can't use facts and reasoning to make well-informed votes, and there's little hope of improving that situation... <laughs> It's a theme today. There's, I'm telling you, this today is today on everything sucks. Star Talk Radio. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, and I'm just I'm going through pages. Got of stacks the, of them. I've got what stacks is, of them. Is there them. a payoff uh, phrase there at the end? Well, the payoff is: um, Should we consider changing the way we vote? Well, this That's, is hey uh, Ross Anderson. You know the. Yeah. No matter what else happened, this is the second time in my lifetime, I guess it's the fifth time in my lifetime, that uh, the popular vote did not determine the, who became president. Uh, yeah. is, do you think there is any way ever that the Electoral College would be modified in any way? Um, I, it sounded like that questioner was referring more to uh, should we be selecting out people who are stupid dem demonstrate yeah. <laughs> some capacity for uh, evaluating judgments uh, scientific evidence to vote and I would say absolutely not absolutely uh, not a, that uh, is ugly history to uh, ugly. ideas like that um, but uh, electoral college reform uh, I'd I probably want to bring on one of my colleagues from uh, the political section. He's uh, blushing. To talk He's about. blushing but it's everyone. interesting it's an interesting idea. Uh, well everything's um, interesting. do you think it's possible? No, not in the near term. And uh, would it be any better or would it just be – the Electoral College, yeah. as I understand it, was created to prevent New York and Pennsylvania from having too much influence. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I think Trump has a good point too when he says, look, I didn't campaign on that. Uh, it's a, the, the campaigns would have looked totally different. It's not the case that, oh – if we had run for a popular vote, Hillary would have easily won by three million. He would have lived in Texas, for instance. Yeah, but he also said that the Electoral College is a disaster. So <laughs> they also thought it was genius. Right. And, well, and then and then it, and then it's the best invention ever uh, once he won. So, so um, and also, Mr. Anderson, do you have any? Are you allowed to express an opinion about? Interference in the election, and by that I mean, well, of course, the direct, inter of course, the direct interference possible by Russia, the influence of the FBI with these spurious emails or redundant emails at the last minute, and then more importantly, the suppression of voting, where you try to create laws and gerrymandering that makes it makes certain people's votes. Um, ineffective or in, uh, not influential the way they would be otherwise. Yeah, I think uh, since we're on, this is a, a science show, uh, I, would, I would say that it seemed to me that you moved uh, in order of strength of evidence uh, when you listed those. So I think there's yeah. excellent evidence that people's, that there's been suppression of voting rights uh, in particular places for obviously politically motivated reasons. Um, uh, and I, I certainly have no reason to doubt the assertions of the entirety of the intelligence community that, you know, uh, Russia seems to have interfered um, with this election. But, uh, you know, I think we have to assign a proper credence to that, given that, you know, that evidence actually has not been published and hasn't been vetted by journalists. It's, we are sort of taking intelligence uh, officials at their word. See there, Chuck, you can't get that point of view without... A guy from the journal, from the mainstream media. It's I, fabulous. I think it's great. <laughs> now, um, uh, let's get one more query, and then pretty soon it's going to be time <coughs> for the lightning round. And uh, so <laughs> let's make it a really quick one. I don't think it needs a. Uh, uh, it, it, this is Bob Farrell from Facebook. When did Star Talk turn all political? What a bummer. Mm. Uh, <laughs> when did it turn? This is your show. I'm trying to. <laughs> I'm a guest host. We're trying to, but here's the here's the scientific question about politics. Okay, uh, how did we get here? It's a surprising thing where we have what would nominally be called an anti-science movement that is very popular. And why is that? What is what has happened with the mainstream science community that uh, things have changed, or seem to have changed? Ross. Oh man. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's interesting that no one identifies as anti-science. Um, Hi, I'm my, my anti-science. This is my yeah. card. <laughs> Here's my business card. Oh, no, you're right. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's not a – I mean, people 
for instance, uh, much opposition to vaccines is a matter of alternate of people saying that, you know, scientists uh, uh, are in fact the ones who are ignoring evidence. Um, so maybe that's something that we can, um, it's, it's a comfort to me, albeit a small one in, in, this, uh, in these weeks, uh, that um, people are still appealing to science as an authority. Uh, are you, how do you mean? Like in the case of vaccinations, they're appealing to science? Uh, I mean that it would be all the, like it would be really distressing if people were just outright saying that actually science is worthless. It tells us nothing mm -hmm. um, of interest on these subjects instead of actually the scientists that I listen to or That's know, right. it's this based particular on, data. Yeah, it's, people it's, are appealing to the same intellectual standard. Uh, see, there you go. Mm hmm yeah, the, my authorities are better authorities than your authorities. And uh, right. this idea that the authorities on the other side are part of a conspiracy is remarkable. Hmm. And, uh, and so we'll see how that shakes out. Let's get another query. Are we in the last five minutes? I think we it's are. It's lightning time. It's lightning time. <laughs> lightning time. <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, this is Robert Lane. If everything is made of energy, then everything that was or will be is already here. If humans are made of energy, where is all the energy coming from to increase the population? Oh, like, dude, that's <laughs> like away, so out there. <laughs> <laughs> the reason humans are able to live on the earth is we have energy from a nearby star, the sun, and we grow food. Yes, there's uh, internal energy in the earth that moves tectonic plates around, which has a great effect on the carbon cycle and so on. But the primordial energy that created the sun came from the Big Bang. And do you know why we had a Big Bang? Nobody knows why. There you go. <laughs> so some people are very troubled by that. And they, that, that there's this huge unknown. Other people think, wow, that's cool. Let's call, let's find more. Let's learn more about that. Let's do astronomy and agronomy and agriculture and physics and chemistry and change the world. I, uh -huh. I digress. Take it. One more question. There we go. Um, uh, this is Jess Woods from Facebook. Uh, Dear Bill, how can we effectively teach the youth and educate others about topics such as climate change, evolution, when we uh, are encountering resistance at the same time so well chuck it's easy you watch bill nye the science guy while you're in school there you go you watch bill nye saves the world on netflix <laughs> you listen to ross anderson at the atlantic and you listen to star talk and turn it up loud bingo i like it minute and a half chuck All let's right, go here we go um let me see. Oh, God. What are the odds of Neil and Bill reaching out to the administration uh, to propose realistic goals for manned space exploration? So this is what we want to do at the Planetary Society. We want to have humans orbiting Mars in 2033 without increasing the NASA budget at all. With the people that are coming in to NASA with the Trump administration is very reasonable. We can move that to orbits earlier. And by orbits, I mean orbital opportunities, 2028. Here's what we want out there, everybody. Let's not have a reset on, on human spaceflight. Let's use the existing hardware. The Orion space capsule, CTS-100, the um, uh, SpaceX's Dragon capsule. Let's use the existing stuff and advance space science and exploration. In the meantime, everybody out there, let us continue the search for life with robots on Mars and Europa. A discovery of life on another world would change this one. Planetary.org will tell you all about it. There you go. Uh, One last question, Chuck. This is Hugo from Facebook says, can you demonstrate that the term alternative fact is just a marketing type rebranding of the term propaganda? Take it. Ross. Ross. 12 seconds. Propaganda. Um, uh, <laughs> where to begin? <laughs> he laughs uh, out loud. <laughs> You've been listening to Star Talk All Star. We have uh, this week's guest has been uh, Ross Anderson from The Atlantic. He's a senior editor. Chuck Nice, funny as well as funny looking. And I've been your guest host, Bill Nye. Listen to Star Talk. Turn it up loud. Thank you all very much. This is Star Talk.